go. Welcome everybody to another OSPO Metrics Working Group. I am your facilitator, Gary White. Let's jump right into it. Uh, the first agenda item we have is how do OSPOs measure and respond to maintainer and licensing changes? This was from me. Uh, <laughs> I'm asking this question because we had a a uh, pretty interesting thought experiment of can we, um, well, separately, this is how this came up. In the Augur working group, we were talking about could we predict something like what happened with XZ? Could we predict something like what happened with Redis where licensing changes and maybe there's some committer that's doing something that we don't, wouldn't like? And uh, I see Jamie Tana is very interested as he's trying to build up automated tooling. I don't think I wrote that, so I'd love to hear from whoever put that up, but also just want to open up the discussion. If anybody in their OSPO has ways that they measure or respond to maintainer and licensing changes, I'd like to talk about it here. So, um, go ahead. Go ahead. You no, know, you go ahead, James. Uh, I was just going to say, uh, the way that we respond to it is mostly uh, the OSPO isn't the one for driving that. It's our lawyers. Um, so anytime there's a, a licensing change that comes through, uh, basically, we get we get told from on high, hey, this is something to be concerned about, or we need to start changing our policy around this, uh, and then we we go from there. So, and I, I would just echo that that is one of the items in a university setting where I hear from the lawyers frequently is around licensing. Like they want to know how I'm licensing every single research product. Hmm. So I don't, I think, I mean, so I guess what I'm saying is I think the licensing thing and lawyers might be common. I'm not sure. I mean, it sounds like it. it sounds like at least two different uh, areas are dealing with like legal kind of handles it. And then we take that information in. That's good. It's good feedback. I have a question about that. Um, what are other OSPOs doing um, with that? Like what is, what is your um, participation in that or scope in that? Do you just take that information and then disseminate it out to your open source developers? Uh, well, it depends on, you know, if there's any form of, you know, drastic steps we need to take. So like if it's a, uh, you know, a change that, uh, I mean, I used to, when I worked at Amazon, we were always scared of GPL3, but at Microsoft, we're not. And so like what, when it, I was at Amazon, it was like, oh, full stop if it's it's a change from like mit or apache to gpl3 then oh we can't use that anymore at all but at microsoft it's just like oh well this is just something we need to take into consideration uh we have all we do a scan of all of our packages uh internally and what we use to make sure that we understand what we're doing of course uh, and what we're using and then uh we can check against that and say like okay who's using this package now we have the list of people that we actually need to contact and say like hey here's the extra steps you need to take or the things you need to think about when using this package. Um, and then we update our internal docs that are uh, available to the entirety of the company that uh, allows them to, uh, that we then say, uh, uh, yeah, this is a package that we know uh, you might need to take some extra care about. Here's those steps uh, and then go from there. So that almost sounds like you're using an application catalog to find folks who use a particular package and then reach out to them directly. Is Correct. That, do I have that right? Yeah. Yeah, uh, we're we're uh, we also use it to solve what we call the Nebraska problem, the the one developer in Nebraska, uh, and mm -hmm. so that's one of the things that we're working on right now as well. Of uh, it, you know, it pairs with it of like, hey, what are the things that we're dependent on that are potentially vulnerable to a, mal a malicious user? Uh, XZ is not one of those packages that we were tracking, uh, but it, uh, uh, you know, that's the kind of idea of like, hey, we if we're dependent on this, then we should be. Uh, doing something with it but that's that's beyond the the scope of this conversation but yes so we have a catalog of all of the the open source that we use uh we it used to be uh very top level so like if you're using uh node you know we'd only we'd only say like oh you're dependent on whatever's in the package json now we go multiple levels deep i think we go four or five levels deep so we get dependencies of the dependencies of the dependencies so that we we can have a, a much clearer picture of, of exactly what we're looking for uh, and then go from there
Yeah, uh, you mentioned that you take steps to measure the Nebraska problem, and that's my nudge to you to attend the metrics working group next week, where we're going to be talking about something really similar that sparked this discussion. Because we'll I think we'll you'll you'll definitely find that interesting. Um, Callie has a lot to say about how research methods might help us try to find how you might identify that in the future. Um, okay, uh, Alyssa, I think you uh, spoke up. once or twice in there and didn't get a chance so to this is this is really interesting um our lawyers are not the ones that necessarily generate uh, a response to license changing but they're like stakeholders in the conversation um it usually comes from uh more of our uh like pto head um and and it, and and we speak to like we usually have some sort of like uh unofficial or formalized like doc document to help guide people so but so like a cto will have a policy of like oh hey this licensing change happened this is what we should be doing about it and the ospo helps enforce that yes and i wouldn't say force and for i mean well yeah yeah like, you, uh, you, you guide, said set partner yeah, you <laughs> yeah 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 help they help there They're help yeah, exactly Don't, don't don't like to think of ours as enforcers generally, yeah, no, but they have, they have the, they have they have the but I guess what I'm saying is that lawyers are definitely involved, but and and sometimes I feel like it would even be easier if they they could just leave that type of um uh prop like it like issue, but instead um it it does become something that's more of like a A, a framework and guidelines given from from a CTO mm -hmm. perspective. Cool. Anyone else want to share how OSPOs measure, respond to maintainer and licensing changes like this? Any other thoughts, ideas? So the elastic. So I'm um, Jamie Tanner, the one who put his name on the doc. Um, but yeah, so like we're. kind of thinking about it at the moment like how can we provide like automated ways of either picking up that a license has changed or that there are new maintainers um on the project um so in some ecosystems it's easy to know that because um there is maintainer metadata in the package um or for instance if it's been forked it's a little bit clearer that new maintainers are probably on it um Uh, yeah, there have been a few things recently where um, we've been considering um, what the license changes mean for us, but that's more been from a legal point of view and trying to just understand our compliance, um, but we don't have a good solution. Um, we're trying to find an automated way of doing it because mm -hmm. that's better for everyone. I'm seeing a lot in the chat. Uh, Sean, I think you're definitely following it better. Is there anything else we should uh, pull out of there? Uh, I just, um, I think SSH XC is a little bit differently than the license change. It's more like a, a bad actor problem. Right. And I, I, I think probably what's interesting about this, I'm sure we've all read a ton about it. Remy, the Cosmaker, shared these three links that I put in the notes with me yesterday. Uh, and I think those those are some of the more detailed assessments or analysis that, that I've seen. And there's some prime... I guess what historians would call primary data or primary sources, um, you know, actually looking at the email lists and the one, the one post I think it's the Rob Menching post actually goes through and breaks down the social engineering of how this person basically socially hacked their way into a critical piece of software by uh, intimidating an overwhelmed maintainer, which I'm sure none of us can relate to. Definitely not. I see Isaac's hand up. Yeah, I just wanted to uh, chime in a bit on like the intersection between like, license concerns and this uh, XC vulnerability. Um, they're they're not like the it's definitely of a different nature, but they're definitely not unrelated. Like uh, the, the the malicious actor, one of the things that they did that was particularly egregious and and should have been caught as a red flag was they went into the security.md file. of the project and change the contact address to their own personal email um that was, was for oss fuzz by the way yeah. the google project like a 
very significant project. Wow. So, yeah. Um, yeah. So, so that's that's a bit semi-related to you know tracking changes to those uh, critical files such as the license. But yeah, it, it's yeah. This is Remy chiming in, and uh, yeah, we are contemplating adding a repo linter rule for making sure that if there are any changes to security.mv, for example, uh, that's the kind of thing that can hit CI and flag an error and give a little bit of a, a heads up or a warning in case we find that in repositories that we're, we're tracking. So under development, one of the things we've learned from, uh, from watching this play out, and we're still following and learning. Uh, this is an ongoing incident. Thanks, Remy. Awesome. Uh, sorry, I'm taking a note. I I can't believe that email address thing. I didn't know that, and that's that's quite a note to to be able to make mention of. Um, yeah, and I think. Uh, more on that intersection, Sean. I, I think it. I wanted to bring it up to this group that that uh, has a lot of OSPOs and OSPO people in it because I think we normally have some kind of response when these events happen to inform the organization to help influence whether or not uh, developers should or will continue to use this software. And I think how we respond to it and how we might measure it would be an interesting chat because it's usually kind of a similar response. I think Moisha has a, is it Moisha? I think Moisha has a question or their hand is up anyway. Tell me if I said your uh, name wrong. Yeah, uh, sorry, I have an issue with my computer. So, so yeah, on my side, we are uh, OSPO new bit. So um, I'm from uh, Canada, Montreal, and I'm working on the ACT company. And we just uh, uh, build and put in place the OSPO. And we are, this is a very, very interesting uh, subject about the, the, the license complaints, because uh, we deal with the PI, so the inter, uh, mm -hmm. IP, the IP, intellectual uh, property. And uh, this is a very, very uh, important um, question we have always. So which kind of uh, license we gonna use to pre and preserve the, the IP? So this is a very, very, Good at it. And uh, I really, really uh, want to hear about uh, how the, the the company, like uh, the company, the government company, or the the company that um, which have a, a, a huge compliance, they, uh, does with the license compliance, or the the license uh, issue. Absolutely, and welcome. By the way, yeah, happy to have you. you. Yeah. Um. Okay, I think we talked about uh, sometimes legal is super involved, sometimes legal is setting policy, sometimes policy comes outside of legal and they're more of like partners. Um, Ed's hand is up. Sorry about that, Ed. I keep missing the hands going up. You're on mute. Thanks. Um, I, I just want to add another... Um, group that is likely to be involved when things change abruptly and uh, that there's concern that happens that needs to be addressed in the incident. And that's the corporate incident response team of various sorts. Um, might be a product security incident response team. It might be a emergency response team, but basically in, in my experience, it's often attached to the security folks in an organization who are ready to spin up a team at short notice to deal with a problem that needs to be responded to quickly that might have a severe impact. Uh, it's rare that a license change is going to be like that, um, but certainly something like the XE incident is like that, where you're like, there's something very bad that happened and we don't know what our impact is. And we need a team that's tasked with that sort of thing to deal with it. My working assumption is that most OSPOs are not either staffed or tasked to do incident response. I guess I'd like to test that assumption. Um, but you know, understanding that the OSPOs could very much 
inform an incident response team, that they should communicate with an incident response team, but they might be very different from that, uh, from that sort of team and that sort of structure for things. Yeah, I can actually speak to this that um, at, at Verizon, the OSPO is very close with the cybersecurity team. And there's pretty significant overlap of the data that we like to collect and that the cybersecurity team likes to collect, namely SBOMs, um, what packages are in use, what the licenses and vulnerabilities and all that good stuff is for those packages. Uh, but that uh, I think incident response team is an interesting uh, difference that I'm not sure if we do or not. And I think that's just a function of um, it's a huge organization. I, I've only been here for a year. Um, but like, I definitely think that that is something that uh, you might expect at a bigger organization. I wonder if smaller organizations, when they pair with cybersecurity teams, do the same like legal response of here's the guidance and we'll help you do it. Or if that that kind of security uh, you know, task force is common. Yeah, I do wonder about scale, like at at Verizon scale, at Equinix scale, you can have these teams. Right. As corporations get smaller and the teams get smaller, um, you know, the office might be one person. Um, you know, right. they have a security lead, and that's what they did. Um, yeah, thanks, Alyssa. That's I, I I I'm I'm not surprised by that. Um, yeah, I actually, like, just even in terms of the organization of the OSPO, we sit really close, like, both physically and in the same team, sit really closely with a lot of security efforts. Same in Microsoft. Uh, a lot of what we do when there's a, a incident response is mostly just making sure that uh, we're, we are taking proper response. So we're the advocates for like, yeah, you can't go in and, and try and bulldoze this community uh, just because we use them and we're Microsoft. Uh, and so there's a lot of uh, coordinating between teams to make sure that we're, we're having uh, proper public responses and we're uh, making sure security is happy. So same kind of stuff. And, and, yeah, and, I, and if I could do like a call back to one of the prior conversations we've had in the past about like the value of, of OSPO, um, I found myself recently even more so like talking about like the security, um, like management, like risk management, just being like, like I, I, I seem it's sometimes hard to even talk, like, have to talk outside of security always being there. Right. It's like the same way that like lawyers are like always there too. Like I feel mm -hmm. like more and more so like security are like you know on my left and right shoulder. Um, <laughs> left and right, both from security, huh? Yeah. <laughs> 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 yes. All right. Um, this has been like a really interesting and fruitful discussion. Uh, I appreciate everybody's participation. Uh, I think we've pretty much gone down all the avenues. Does anybody have more that they'd like to share, new perspectives, new ideas, or should we move on? Well, let's call it the Nebraska problem for now on. Is that? Yeah. <laughs> Can we adopt that now? Can we make that? Oh, boy. I, I don't know, Don. Are we renaming Bus Factor? Naming I think Nebraska came back up. Naming is hard. <laughs> for anybody that has opinions, I will drop the link in the chat. We are looking at renaming Bus Factor. Yeah. Um, sorry, I don't Alyssa, know what I was is... thinking, kicking off a naming discussion. That was just silly. Yeah. I, I, uh, that I had seen the Nebraska um, come up as a suggestion when we were looking to rename Bus Factor. It's it's a it's a tough thing. I mean, um, really, it's it's only for the best if we continue to make XKCD part of everyone's culture and tech. Right. It's critical reading for all technologists. All right, uh, second. Order here is the Chaos Cast OSPO Spotlight Series. Uh, if you would like to talk about how your OSPO uses metrics or measures value, Don is organizing uh, folks from different OSPOs to come on a podcast and talk about it. I'm going to be participating. 
surprise. Mm -hmm. And I uh, would love to be alongside more of you um, to talk about these really cool like value propositions and how we measure them. Don, go ahead. Yeah, that would be great. So I get, we kind of got the idea because we did one with we did one with Microsoft and that worked really well. And then we did one with uh, with Remy's team at the um, CMS from more of a government perspective, and that also went really well. And so I was I was thinking, how can we get more more podcasts about about OSPOs? And so I do have a couple of people signed up. So thanks, Ed and Gary have have already said that they would do one. I also talked to Wolfgang at uh, Mercedes, so he's he's also going to do one. Um, so if you'd like to do one to talk about how your OSPO measures stuff, uses data, um, you know, anything basically relevant to chaos, uh, just reach out to me and let me know. Reach out to Don. Yeah. Um, I'm going to say on the idea of reach out to Don, I'm just going to skip a few and come back to the others, that the Partic Practitioner Guide for Contributor Sustainability is ready for review. I've dropped the link um, to the Practitioner Guide there. Don also posted in the channel. Uh, give some reviews, give some feedback, give some ideas. It only gets better with more input and diversity. Uh, and there's a bunch of other guides that are still available for contribution if you want to get involved. Yeah, for sure. And I am really, I would really love, in particular, this group. Um, so, so you all, the people that work in OSPOs, other people I've been kind of soliciting feedback from. And I've gotten some, some really amazing feedback on some of the other uh, so these used to be called insight guides and uh, practitioner guides, um, and I've had some really good feedback so far. So I would I would love to see more of that for the contributor sustainability one. Agree, agree. Although I I can't speak, I'm not writing one. I'm just reading all of them. Uh, all right, next couple orders. Uh, OSSNA. Are there any talks that people are excited about? Anybody that's going that they know they're going to go and see. I'm excited about our viability panel. Oh boy, what a segue. Yeah, we're, we're um, if you're going to OSSNA, come support us, come see us. Uh, come to the chaos day uh, on the first day. There's one in the morning and one in the afternoon. So pick your poison. Um, I think both of those are gonna be super exciting. And then obviously two of us, Don and me and Emma, if you're on the call, maybe. Emma Irwin, who's a regular in the OSPO working group, will also be there. And we'll be talking about um, oh, it's a, uh, viability. And it's a super exciting topic for me. So I'm really excited to talk about it. But I'd love to hear about other stuff that folks might be interested in seeing. We'll be talking. Uh, I'll be talking on Thursday. Uh, I'll put the link in um, about SBOMs and software um, supply chain security. Um, both in a technical as well as cultural like way. Uh, like a, so um, I'll be speaking with um, an engineering partner um, in the OSPO track. And then um, I think that um, talking about Emma again, I think that the FOSS funders group that I'm a part of, so this is about how to like help sustain open source um, uh, projects, both with like time and money. Um, we're doing a birds of feather. We're going to sign up for a birds of feather, um, which I think my understanding is that you have to do when you're when like in person. So keep an eye out for that as well. Would that be on the schedule, or you said it's just? I don't think so. I think I think it's yeah. I think it will. Well, it's not on the schedule yet. It's something that we have to sign up for when we uh, when we arrive. But it will be about FOSS, like funding. Um, funding open source for sustainability. Awesome, awesome. Cool. When that when that gets scheduled, if you um, if you have time, if you could drop maybe just a note in the Slack channel for the OSPO working group and let us know when it's when it's going to be, because I do think that would be a really interesting discussion. Yes, for sure. Thanks. Uh, my teammate Justin Gozes is actually going to be doing a talk on uh, uh, we call them repo cohort cohorts, but it's uh, how we categorize uh, different policies for different sizes of repos, uh, and so that we can, you know, have uh, policies that are fit for things like VS Code or TypeScript, but then also not have to hold those same standards for somebody that's like, oh, I wrote this sample script for Azure, 
for this one Azure service uh, and how we approach that. So it's a it's an interesting talk in my opinion. Yeah, I'm actually Before. thinking about that problem right now. Thanks. <laughs> yeah, we're we're excited to share the uh, the stage with Justin and company. Uh, the CMS OSPO is going to join on the repository cohorts uh, talk and. We'll be presenting some things that you folks are probably very familiar with in this group. We've demoed the maturity models and the repo scaffolder project, but uh, there's some exciting upstream commits that we made to the Augur project that uh, we're excited to share with people at the summit. So uh, stay tuned and uh, tell Justin, uh, you know, we're looking forward to seeing him when you, when you talk to him. Awesome. And sorry, uh, James, you said that was Justin. What was the last name? Gozes, G-O-S-S-E-S. -S -S. Awesome. Thank you. Oh, I'll also be on a panel with uh, with Nithya and Allison Randall and um, uh, Ildico about uh, careers in open source, if anybody's interested in that. In the um, in the in which track? That's an excellent question. I don't remember. <laughs> Sorry. I think that the the reason I, I want to take down like the names in a brief description is I think now you can all you can search by name and sketch. So like if yeah, you're going to the to conference, you can be like, hey, here it is, and like build your schedule based on that. DEI project badging. I it's see in the in. open source, open source 101 track. Don, I think you also have an ask the expert um, table as well. And I, I remember going to that and I actually really enjoyed hearing from people um, who were not in chaos, who came to that table to ask about metrics. Oh yeah. I, I, I forgot about that. I am doing an ask the expert on, um, I think anything related to, uh, Chaos or open source project health metrics. So if some of you want to come along and help me answer questions. That would be cool too. Woo. So much cool stuff. I'm so excited for this. Thing. I'm not sure why I signed up for so much, but. Also, I just will interject that chaos does have a, a booth there. So if anybody here wants to do any chaos booth duty, you are welcome to do it. It's super easy and really fun. And you get to just sit and chill at our table for a while. So um, we have a sign up sheet. Just let me know if that's something that's of interest to you and I will hook you up. All right. That's on my to do list. I am going to sign up for some shifts. I just haven't done it yet. Shifts are only like an hour long, so not that big. Cool. All right. I got plenty of stuff to put on my sketch now, um, which was the whole reason I asked. That's that's it. Uh, anything else from anybody else while we're here or shall we move on? Um, just one more thing I um, put in the chat. Um, there's a talk from Sony's OSPO, um, and I wonder if anyone's connected with Sony's OSPO and would like to invite them to this working group. Yeah, that sounds good. I'm taking a look at it now. But we can move on as well. Quantitative method for open source contribution value and its impact on Sony's business strategy. Yeah, that does sound super interesting. Yeah, that's pretty cool. We'll absolutely try to recruit, I mean, interest them with this group. Um, all right. Let's keep rolling. Um, Chan, you asked a question that I thought would be a good item for this group uh, to ask. Has AI helped any strategy changes or initiatives around our OSPOs in a way that we want to talk about in, in this forum? Uh, 
And actually, this was brought up because Dawn asked me to participate in the podcast around OSPOs and AI, and then I started to think more about this. Yeah, I recruited a couple of folks for a podcast about AI and OSPOs. So um, Ashley, uh, Ashley Wolf from uh, GitHub's OSPO and uh, Brian Prophet from Red Hat and uh, Matt German Prey, I think is going to um, help me moderate that. Awesome. So that should be fun. Here's your chance, everybody. If you're using AI, we can talk about it now and get recruited for a podcast. Yeah, the, yeah, uh, definitely. Uh, see, we talk about uh, we talk about the licenses uh, early, but uh, the AI can help also to check the license uh, to to be a company um, as a license in the any type type of uh, any type of license we are we are, we are uh, checking for. So yeah, AI definitely uh, could help in the the OSPO to put in place the license. The good license is uh, is adapt for for our requirement. Yeah. So. But is that AI we, or automation? The AI organization. Or automation. Like what? Uh, automation. Oh, okay. How, how do you make the distinction? Well, how do you make the distinction? How how do you define the the difference? Uh, the AI based automation. So, but we suppose that uh, the AI can uh, use like uh, the model to check uh, the compliance uh, using uh, about the license. So, to be sure you are compliant uh, on the license, the AI can help it. Yeah, uh, automation also, but uh, if we already, already have a, like a model exist on the on the compliance, uh, you just use it. You're going to just use it to accelerate, yeah. So you have a model that can check the licenses of the components that you're using and give you an idea of whether or not you're within compliance. Is that yeah, long yeah. of it? OK. Seems like a good use case. Sometimes licenses are all kinds of different formats, and maybe you can read it better or read a lot of them. Yeah. Anyone else? I know this is a really exciting topic that everybody's very happy about. <laughs> no, AI can be polarizing. I just thought it was an interesting question if anybody has some cool use cases. See, also, the, you, we used to do the, to put in place our OSPO, uh, OSPO teams. We use, we use a lot of uh, documentation from to do, to do group, and uh, we can automate it using gen ai so the guys come and ask uh, what's the good um, uh, building block we have to put in place to start our ospo journey and uh, the gen ai just uh, give us the step by step uh, from the to do group uh, database something like this is this something you did or something you think could work <laughs> no we didn't do it we just use the to-do group uh, website documentation and follow the step by step, but uh, we can have a, the assistant to you can build the assistant to uh, to do it for, uh, for another. Uh, sure. Another, yeah. Hey, this is uh, Remy on the phone. So hey, Remy. this isn't OSPO. This isn't OSPO specific, but if you go to ai.gov. Uh, there is a section where all of the agencies have reported various AI use cases across the federal government. So, uh, you know, just throwing that out there is like a, if people are searching for AI use cases, that's one place where they are being collected as part of the AI executive order uh, that came out of the Biden administration earlier this year. Good to know. Forever looking for those use cases. All right. Anyone else? All right. Let's move on. Um, practitioner guide we covered. So now we're to the reminders. Reminder, 
there will be no meetings for chaos the week of April 15th. Uh, OSSNA is that week. Too many people will be there. There won't be enough people to hold these meetings. Um, the next OSPO working group meeting will then be May 2nd. May 2nd, we'll be back. This is the last time till then. Uh, chaos Con NA on April 15th, registration is open. It is co-located with OSSNA. This is what I've been calling Chaos Day. It is no longer Monday. Uh, join the Visualizing Metrics with Software Monitoring event. You can see it there. And um, I'll let some folks from Chaos say anything else that they might want to uh, share about that event. Or not. That's cool, too. Um, OSS... that's pretty much it. It's going to be fun. Come join us. Yeah, it'll be great. Um, and then there's a CFP for OSSEU 2024. We covered this last time, but I thought I'd bring it back up because it's still open. It'll be fun if you get something accepted and you get to go to OSSEU. Are there any other items folks would like to bring up in this group? Or shall we depart until May 2nd? All right, until, oh, Elizabeth has a very important message. It is only $10 for ChaosCon and $7 for the visualization workshop. That is money well spent. That's less than 20 bucks. That's like less than a McDonald's meal these days. Well, and these fees only exist to help us be more certain about the participation. Because if you don't charge a dollar or something, then everybody just says, it's free, I'll sign up. And then you get some fraction of the attendees so mm. we're not getting rich off that 10 bucks would you all yeah, be sure. able to for the drinks afterwards yeah <laughs> I, don't, I don't i don't no comment no, I, I, I don't know like... I don't, i'm not sure where that pot comes from helps probably pay event fees in part i'm i'm assuming you know like drinks um all right that's it then uh, thank you, everybody, for attending another um, OSPO Metrics Working Group. I have been your facilitator, Gary White, and I will see you again soon. Bye-bye. No Great problem. job, Gary. Thank you. Thanks, Gary. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.